hello, hello, and welcome back to Modern Education here on KZSU on the Stanford campus. I'm the host of Modern Education, Benjamin S. Woodford, here in the studio one more time with my lovely co-host, Emily Quiles. Hello, everybody. Happy and, happy Friday. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> As it, always. We are here every Friday from 3 to 4 p.m. for yes. your commute home, whether you are tuned in to 90.1 FM on the FM dial and probably listening to us in your car because that's where anyone ever has a radio anymore, right? Unless you have a radio in your home, but yeah, uh, it's I, I, probably I'm like car. streaming online at this point. <laughs> I have no radios yeah. in my house. I think my clock alarm may still have a radio, but most of you are probably <laughs> listening from your car if you're on the FM dial or if you are streaming online. We are streaming worldwide on the internet yes, at kzsu.stanford.edu. We are always happy to have listeners listening in from... Anywhere from Poland to Bangkok to anywhere in between. We love our <laughs> listeners, international, national, across state lines. Everybody who's tuning in to Modern Education, we value you very much. You can always get a hold of us here in the studio. What's that number, Kila? It is 855 And of course, you can get us on the Twitters and the Facebooks and the Instagrams. All of those social media. We're medias. on Modern Education at KZSU on the Instagram, Modern Education on Facebook. You can look me up at Ben Woodford one on the Twitter. And we always love hearing from you. You can also get us at KZSU or at KZSU DJ. We have a monitor bringing in your tweets to the KZSU studio right here. Um, so if you are just tuning in and you have not heard Modern Education before, what we do is we bring you some educational content, interviews from across the Stanford community and beyond. Mm-hmm. And we love talking about education, learning, and sometimes we just do a little educating if we need to te- bring you into a new topic. Last week, we talked a little bit about climate change. Mm-hmm. This week, what are we talking about, Gilas? We are talking about bias. Bias. Ah, uh, dun, bias. dun, dun, It takes over every area that we live in, pretty much. <laughs> pretty oh much. Gosh. That was like a... I feel biased against that claim, <laughs> but I might be wrong. <laughs> bias. See? Uh-huh. I proved my point. <laughs> I think so, yeah. Um, so... I think we could just dive right in here. Our theme yeah. music is just finished, so I think we could actually start with our content. Now, I'm wondering for you, what would you even define? What is your de- understanding or definition of what a bias is? My understanding is that it's something that, like the way that we are trained when we are young, that permeates later on in our life on the way that we view the world, um, whether that be cultures, ourselves, or subjects, things. Um, It's the way that we have been perceived to perceive these things. Interesting. Okay, so I'm going to try to clean that up a little bit. Yeah, I think and, it needs some cleaning a- up. <laughs> academicize. Academ- yeah, yeah, that's, that's, your, not a, that's why you're that's here. Not, Let's that's make not this a word, academicize. But I'm going to academicize <laughs> anyway. So uh, when I'm thinking of bias, this is uh, you know integral to the research I'm doing here at Stanford mm-hmm. right now. So I have a, uh, a and my understanding the way I think about bias is thinking about it as an automatic inclination to do a certain type of behavior. So is that something learned or is that just something innate within us? Well, I think the ability or the the tendency to accumulate bias is a m- much more innate thing. There's there's mm-hmm. work in psychology around categorical thinking mm-hmm. that shows that the introductory thoughts we have on a certain topic are generally categorical in nature, which means simply that we put them in little buckets, mm-hmm. right? So when you're introduced to a new topic, say football, your bu- if you it's completely new to you and you know nothing about it, you may put it in a bucket of game, and you may put it in a bucket of exciting or, or sports, boring yeah. or whatever, yeah. right? And so we just create these sort of categorical buckets that help us make sense of the world. Mm-hmm. And it's only um, when we're just getting introduced or we're just making a decision without really thinking about it too much or automatically processing a, a piece of information, generally it just gets sort of categorized or put in a little bucket. So it's the act of categorizing topics, views, ideas. Well, one way you might think about it is thinking about bias being essentially an inclination to put something in a certain bucket more readily, Mm -hmm. right? So if you see, I don't know, if you see a black person, you may look at them and think, oh, whatever you think about black people. And that could be the bucket that you put them in. And certain Mm -hmm. people may have racist buckets, Other people may have, you know, uh, just normal buckets. (laughs) I don't know. You might look at a black person and be like, hey, that's a 
person. And yeah. that's their bucket you put them in. Or you may think criminal. Or these are the kind of things that mm-hmm. come up often in the bias research. Is mm-hmm. Now, I'm going I'm to tell you a little bit about that. I just recently went to a talk with Jennifer Eberhardt, who is a researcher here at Stanford, who does a lot of bias research around um, police shootings and police um, training around bias. Okay. And one of the findings that she had that has come up in her research, actually in multiple different contexts, this has been kind of done to death in her work. Um, pardon the pun there. This is not an appropriate <laughs> pun given the context of police shootings. I apologize for that. But her, um, some of her findings have shown things, really simple things, like if you put a person in a picture holding something and they are either a black person or a white person, you may be more biased to identify the thing they're holding as a gun, whether or not it is. Mm -hmm. And this is a a pretty scary thing when you think about this in the context of police shootings, that they have done a lot of work showing that people will naturally and more readily and quickly designate an object in a black person's hand as a gun versus a white person. So can you break that down? What are the implications of like a police officer of that bias that is going through his head that creates that assumption? That's a, it's an interesting question that I'm not sure I can answer necessarily, mm-hmm. but I can certainly try. And think about it like this. If you have a, a categorical bias to say black person criminal, mm-hmm. and that is an easier thing to access than black person hardworking individual or black person citizen, mm-hmm. then when you see someone, especially if you're in a high pressure situation as a police officer, you're not trying to do long-term deliberative thinking to decide what you do next. You're trying to think quick and make sure that you're not putting yourself in a bad situation. Mm -hmm. And these tests that they've done, the research, uh, specifically Jennifer Eberhardt's research, looks at speedy categorizations. So it's, you know, millisecond choices of who is this person. Mm -hmm. And when we're making these millisecond choices, which I think does mirror the situation that a police officer might be feeling in the field, is I need to act quickly or my life could be in danger. Mm -hmm. We are more inclined to choose maybe a negative um, disposition towards somebody we're looking at and their skin color is a strong contributor to how we make that distinction. Mm -hmm. And so I wouldn't think of this as something where the person is necessarily being racist because they're not consciously thinking, ooh, there's a person that I don't like and I want to do something against them to hurt them. I don't think that's generally how it works. I mean, certainly there are cases where people are just outwardly racist. But for me, and I think a lot of the the bias research really focuses on a specific type of bias, which is not just bias in general. Like if if I say, if, if a person says that they are racist and they have a racial bias, that's not really that interesting, right? Because we already know they're racist. They just told us. Mm -hmm. Now, the bias that becomes really interesting to a lot of people, and there's a lot of work on this out of Project Implicit in Harvard. uh, Harvard has this Project Implicit, which they've collected millions and millions of of bias um, data points by giving people something called an implicit association test. That's the test I took earlier, which we can talk about later. We're going to get to that. And we've taken, we've both taken some of these tests. I take way too many of these tests (laughs) if I'm, if I'm really honest with you. Um, But what, what is really the interesting piece of, of measuring someone's bias using these implicit association tests is when your stated interest or view of a certain group is different than the bias that we're able to measure. So think about it like that. Nobody's surprised when someone who tells you they're racist acts in a racist way. Mm -hmm. But it is really surprising when someone who doesn't want to be racist and doesn't feel racist still comes up with a bias against certain uh, racial groups or gender groups or ability groups, mm-hmm. right? Now, I actually found this when I was taking the test itself. It wasn't again with race, but gender. And mm-hmm. it said that I still had a bias towards what, because um, it was the Wayne family values being female and career mm-hmm. being masculine male. And I saw that my results were slightly, luckily, but I was like, I was shocked that I still had that in my brain DNA or this created pit of my brain. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that shocked me because one of the last questions was, did your results um, change your mind about how you see yourself? 
It was just such a yeah. reflective way of thinking. It was really interesting. So yeah, it, I think that's something that, that's really good to point out is that sometimes we don't realize, or that's the point of bias. We don't realize these things that we are internalizing. Well, that's the thing because uh, so you're a, a pretty feminist kind of woman. You're, you're I would hard, define myself. You're hardworking. Yes. You know, you, you you're putting yourself out there and trying to produce in the world, right? So you see yourself as a woman who's a professional and does professional things. Mm -hmm. And so when these things come up, this is the exact moment where these bias tests become very interesting and intriguing to us. Mm -hmm. Because if you think you're, of yourself a certain way and then you still have this, this bias showing up, and you said it was a slight one, but yeah. it was still in the direction now, where do you think that comes from? I want to say maybe, because I, I don't want to say it comes from my family, because I wouldn't say my family really raised us in that way. Mm -hmm. had a very strong mother. Um, school, possibly. Um, but I also feel like it's more of just like the social pressures that you see, because a lot of the questions were just like, okay, so they would mix around the idea of, family with ma male and career with female and then they would switch those two categories around mm -hmm. and then you'd pick names and words within that um and define them and that's exactly what we're doing we're putting those categories we're putting them in buckets essentially right, right. um and it's just it made me question the test itself like okay how valid is this mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> like is it really testing me for these bias or is it looking for it just to tell me that I am but, but I don't know does that make sense it does I think I can explain some of that for okay you too. that's why so, you're explaining yeah, yeah. this so I'm really glad that you're bringing these things up because first of all this this idea of questioning the test is totally what everybody does when they see this this the result come up differently than how they see themselves like ah that can't be right yeah and who knows, actually? It may not be true that that is completely right or completely wrong. And it may be behaviorally that you're more likely to still do something that falls in line with the way you see yourself, depending on who's watching and the way it's presented. Actually, that's what the research shows us mm -hmm. is that. So the presentation really matters. Yeah, in the way context that matters a lot. And what you do is very much going to change based on that context. For instance, uh, race IATs has, have been given to groups of people. And they vary who gives the test. They have a white person come in and give the test or a black mm -hmm. person come in and give the test. And racial bias goes down considerably as soon as a black person is giving the test to you. Is it because they're being socially or environmentally aware of what they're thinking about? Probably something like that. Yeah, I think we are, are subconsciously cued in to the context, the social context of where we are. And that will actually change the way we think about ourselves, the way we think about who we are, the thing, the things we are willing to sort of associate change a bit. So is our bias something that's not a fixed thing? It's always changing within our context, wherever well, we place ourselves? I wouldn't go that far. I would okay. say our bias is generally pretty stable, mm -hmm. but it also is wildly changeable, which is a weird thing to say, right? So if you were just naturally checking on yourself every couple of weeks on where you're at bias wise and you had some like perfect measure of that that didn't require any kind of questioning, mm. it was just there, your biases probably wouldn't change all that much unless you're getting exposed to new stories, you're taking deliberate efforts to try to change the way you think of and see people. Mm. Um, so... I want to go back a little bit because I think we're getting on a tangent, which we yes. love doing here, right? Uh, if you <laughs> just always. tuned in, we're on Modern Education here at KZSU. We love you listening in. And we are talking about bias. And particularly right now, we're talking about our own bias. So I'm going to go back to what you were talking about, about how you took this, this, uh, theme, this was it a gender IAT? It was a gender one. And then I took a gender with science. So I right. kind of kept up with the theme of gender. Sure, sure. Um that's 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 great. So let's talk about that. <laughs> yes. I, I had nothing useful to say there. I'm like, what? What okay. tests did you take? Uh, I took a few too. So I've taken um, I've taken a bunch of these tests over and over and over again. I've taken the ability, uh, the the disability mm -hmm. or, or physical ability, whatever one. I've taken the uh, the the black white uh, racial one. Okay. I've taken the Asian white racial mm -hmm. one. Is this all from the same platform? Uh, this, these are all from Project Implicit. Okay. Yeah. I've taken the um, 
the skin color one. I've even made a few of my own, actually. Oh, so, you can make them? Yeah, yeah. So I, um, I, I'm doing IAT research right mm-hmm. now, and I've made some that are looking at math bias. So, okay. You know, like, I see myself as a math person or not. And a few others. And these are really fun tests. I think they're they're interesting enough that you're actively yeah, doing something. they were. When, when I first it. took right. it, I was really interested, and so it just got me motivated to yeah, keep I'll going. Yeah, I'll tell you, when you get your hundredth one, they, I stop, they stop being fun. <laughs> By a hundred, wow, that's pretty good. Though. <laughs> yeah, when you've sat down and just taken the same one ten times in a row, you're like, okay, my life is over. But anyway, they're still fun. <laughs> so um, back to this idea of this disconnect, right? Now, it turns out there's some really interesting things that have come up in the bias research, right? Okay. Now, an individual person who, say, considers themselves a feminist and also has a feminism bias against women or thinking women belong in the kitchen or whatever those, those mm-hmm. kind of like stereotypes are, mm-hmm. it turns out one individual, that may not predict very much about what they do, that, that result, Right. So, what do you mean? So like the So your individual results may not mean that you're like gonna encourage your kids to be housewives and it may not gotcha. mean that you're not gonna get a job and look for a stay at home position as a as a homemaker, right? Mm-hmm. But what we do find is that regionally the conglomeration of the IATs that people have taken in a region are very good at predicting trends within that social setting. So I'm gonna try to break that down a little bit for you here, right? Um, if you look at the results of racial IATs at regionally, like by county or state and things like that, okay, what's come up and, and been found, this is very interesting in my mind, is that there will be higher instances of racial bias as a trend in that area correlating very strongly with the, um, the aggregated results of people's IATs. Now think about what that says for a second the social fabric of the area you're living in starts to become apparent through averaging people's results on these IATs. So is that the culture fostered? I would think or of like it, a reflection of I would think of it, yeah. I think these results are probably you could think of as the cultural norms mm-hmm. within the social setting that people are living in. Mm-hmm. So if you're coming up with a trend of a racial bias in a certain county that may very well correlate with, say, police shootings of black people mm-hmm. or even disciplinary actions towards children in school. So basically saying you can see these biases, different types concentrated in different geo geography, different yeah, areas, yeah. different s- suburbs, neighborhoods, areas. Right. That's interesting. Is that yeah. at all accessible to people to look at? Uh, I'm sure you could find it and maybe some of it is open, uh, okay. op- um, open access material. This is all research stuff. So yeah. I, I'd have to say like I can, uh, if you want to get a hold of me and you're listening right now, feel free to text in or find us on the social media and reach out if you would like some of those resources. I'd be happy to compile some of it. And if we ever put this up on when we put this up online, <laughs> we could certainly include some of those references Definitely. in the online posting. It's a great idea. Yeah. So. Thinking about that for a minute, though, right? So if you had a, a whole region that tended to have a strong, um, like, gender bias, you may see less women going to college in that region. Mm-hmm. You may see, you know, more homemakers. You may see more, um, you know, male chauvinist attitudes that are coming out in the social fabric. Mm-hmm. And that would be um, something that probably would correlate very strongly with the, the aggregated results of a region's IATs. So it's a really interesting thing to think about how much putting together and I think this goes back to your question where does this actually come from right you're like oh maybe not my family maybe from like social or school or something right exactly where does this come from well I would say all of those things and more right so bias if you really think about your own bias this is an accumulation of your experiences over a lifetime Mm -hmm. right so um, and there's some really interesting results around this where Black people who grew up around other black people may still have a racial bias against black people. And you go, what? Why would that be the case? Right. And so I think that that particular result helps point us to the fact that or the concept that we're accumulating these socially through the things and the inputs we've been exposed to. So you could imagine, well, okay, so what inputs would uh, an African-American person be exposed to that would make them biased against other Mm African-Americans? And I think that's a pretty easy one to to nail down is it's the rest of society. 
you see it you see people being themselves. depicted as criminals mm. in movies or called thugs in mm-hmm. common language and these kind of things become the narrative that underlies the way we look around ourselves and see the world which ultimately becomes our identity becomes our identity becomes the the biases that mm-hmm. we put on to other people now Claude Steele is a is a researcher here at Stanford who's very famous um for his work on stereotypes, in particular, stereotype threat. Mm-hmm. And he wrote this great book, Whistling Vivaldi, which has a, a I'm going to just kind of relay a bit about this one experience that he frames the book around, which is an African American man walking down the street in New York City. And he's uh, well educated from a good family. He has a lot of uh, like social capital and clout in his own social circles. And as he's walking down the street, he notices white people moving off, uh, moving off the sidewalk to make space for him or mm. averting their eyes and looking away as he walks. Mm-hmm. And he's like, what is going on here? I'm not a criminal. In I'm, New York? I'm dressed well. I'm walking down the street. Yeah. I, I carry myself well. I speak clearly. Why am I seeing this happening? Right. And. Um, the, the person in the, in the story had an adaptation they came up with to be able to help mediate or mitigate this, this problem that they were seeing. They started whistling classical music, Vivaldi particularly. Mm. And by whistling classical music on, in pitch, on, in tune, uh, at, at speed, right? And you could whistle very well. When people would hear this, would white people would hear familiar tune of a like socially culturally relevant song for them get into their own bias they feel more comfortable and they were less likely to step off the sidewalk they were more likely to say hello or make eye contact that's so weird Uh, it's kind of weird but i also just think it's like like, it makes they have an association towards classical music right and now it's wiped away this idea it just shows how like again contact i don't know it's just it doesn't change the person at all. That's the well, point. Yeah, their <laughs> bias didn't go away. It was their perception of who deserved that bias that changed in that moment, mm-hmm. right? So the next black person that walks down the street, they may still step off that sidewalk and have that bias come up in the way they present themselves. But the act of this one person whistling a song that comes kind of from high culture put was enough to put them at ease, Right. So that raises a question for me, or at least the ethical question of, so why, who needs to change? Like, mm, yeah. why, why would he need, or why would a black, African-American black person have to start singing classical music just to feel, be accepted? Why, like, are, is there other ways to where the white person can just, I don't know, eliminate that bias without I, singing I, classical I, music? I can see the frustration in your face right now. Like, <laughs> this isn't fair. It needs to be better, right? Well, yeah. And I agree with you. And I think the, the, the sad thing is, is generally the individual being discriminated against is the one that ends up changing. Mm. And that's a, a sad state of affairs because it's society pushing a certain way of being and thinking or experiencing the world onto a person who is already being discriminated or stereotyped against. Now, that is not my optimal solution. Mm -hmm. My optimal solution would be depicting people in more positive ways across the spectrum, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's all kinds of um, stuff. I mean, like, okay, there's a silly example that happened many many years ago, but there was a movie called The Last Samurai, and it it starred (laughs) Tom Cruise, Okay, right? And you go, well, wait a second. Why can't we have an Asian person playing the last yeah. samurai? Tom Cruise right? got the part. Yeah, yeah, and it's like, okay, well, I mean, I, I guess I understand enough. Like, I, the movie, like the movie is really unimportant in all of this, but it's this idea of having white people playing mm-hmm. uh, different cultural background characters. The representation, right? Yeah. And what's going on there is we're essentially whitewashing the stories that we're exposed to. Mm-hmm. Now, stories are such an important thing, and being exposed to demonstrations of ways to act and be do become part of our framework about how we act and how we are. And that is essentially what these biases are. It is biasing us towards a certain worldview or identity. And in a lot of ways is based on the way we see ourselves, the way we interact in the world, the things we've been exposed to, the stories that we've been exposed to. Now, there's a, 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 a well-known researcher here at Stanford. He's emeritus now, but I did get the pleasure of sitting down and speaking with him for the show. And this is Dr. Albert Bandura. Um, he has done a lot of work towards 
showing how to use these narratives and stories that we see in the world Mm -hmm. to change behaviors. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the, the beginning of this work that he's done around analyzing and looking at behavior change, especially modeling it with social uh, situations Mm -hmm. uh, led to what he, he called his social cognitive theory, which is the idea that we pick up ways of thinking and being from the people around us. Now this all started. And if you've ever taken a a basic uh, intro to philosophy or psychology class, you've probably heard of his work around the Bobo doll experiment. Yes. Right. The Bobo doll looks like a little clown. Right. So the Bobo doll is one of these punching clown dolls where it's like (laughs) weighted at the bottom and it stands upright Mm -hmm. and then you you like punch it and it falls down and it comes back up. And that's what it's designed to do. Now what, Dr. Bandura did is he put some kids in a room and he did this a few different ways. He did it with a live action. He also did it with a video and he also did it with a cartoon, which I think is really interesting. Right. And so he set up these situations where the kids were just in a room and they saw an adult playing with a Bobo doll. When you say playing. Well, there were different types of play. Okay. Now the children who were exposed to the play where the adult was punching and hitting and kicking and saying very specific things to the Bobo doll. Mm -hmm. Then they put the kid in a room where there were a bunch of toys that they could just self-select what they played with. And the Bobo doll was one of them. And what they found is that the children who saw specific violent acts being done to this doll were very likely, much more likely to do those types of acts and they were very specific acts. So you could tell the kid wasn't just ad libbing, but really monitoring and, and trying to reproduce the behavior they had seen. So putting in, putting children in these situations, is it, is, is he doing that consciously to make his point that children are more malleable? Like, is there a reason why he just chose children and not adults? Well, I mean, this is, you know, there's been done in different ways. And I think adults are much more uh, inclined to suppress mm-hmm. socially unacceptable behaviors. So if you put an adult in a room and have them watch another adult doing something socially unacceptable, they may be more inclined to be like, oh, that was not acceptable. I'm not going to do that. Mm-hmm. But I, I think demonstrating this with children shows the nature of people to absorb this. And it also shows how at very young ages we are absorbing the things that we're seeing and hearing and not just in real life, but also in cartoons. Yeah. The virtual television. And this is really important considering how much children are watching our television. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Exactly. So we're going to, we're going to listen to a quick little clip where Dr. Bandura just sort of explains a bit of these behaviors is less than a minute, but stay with us here on 90.1 KZSU Stanford. We'll be right back. Uh, Children uh, watched a a filmed adult uh, perform novel aggressive acts or a uh, inflated doll. And the physical aggression was accompanied by novel uh, hostile uh, uh, remarks. It was once widely believed that seeing others vent aggression would drain the viewer's aggressive drive. As you can see, exposure to aggressive modeling is hardly cathartic. Exposure to aggressive modeling increased attraction to guns, even though it was never modeled. Guns had less appeal to children who had no exposure to the aggressive modeling. The children also picked up the novel hostile language. Yeah, and if you could see the wow. video, it is a little disturbing, it isn't is. it? It is. There's videos of children just beating up this doll. And one of the children, when he was talking about specifically to, uh, of guns, this child was just putting the gun up to the, the doll. And that was really surprising to me because he was saying it wasn't even introduced by him. It was just something right. that he took on himself. Right, right, exactly. So the kids are actually ad-libbing and creating new violent expressions mm-hmm. just because they've been started to, to introduce some kind of violent expression. They may get really creative. To be violent. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you got to imagine, I mean, kids are seeing this in cartoons all the time. You know, I mean, Roadrunner and Coyote, right? I mean, do people actually watch that anymore? I don't know. That's what I grew watched up with. Watched it as a kid. Sure, <laughs> sure. But this idea of just like these violent things are meaningless and kids don't actually get any of that is just not true. Yeah. No. Now, as been as Dr. Bandura went on, he developed this into social cognitive theory. And then a, a, a man named Miguel Sabido took this and turned it into a a way of demonstrating social change through narrative accounts. And this has been pretty powerful. They've done narrative accounts being stories. Stories. Yeah. um, 
serial dramas, they called them. So these are like soap operas, right? Okay. And these are highly crafted and very specific soap operas that are designed to try to create new narratives. And, and it's really hard to implement this in a country like USA because we have so much media saturation that you could never get one of those stories seen and heard and interacted with. I would actually a, challenge that. Yeah, yeah. Because... What we see on Netflix now is completely different. I mean, you can argue that the algorithms give what you watch, um, but at least my algorithms are showing very diverse like storylines that I have not seen ever before. Yeah, yeah. And I think Netflix is actually doing a lot of work using these ideas. I haven't spoken with anyone yes, at Netflix it seems specifically, like they are. but a lot of the new shows are very pro-social. They're yes. giving these positive stories that actually are... Um, seem to me to be actually a lot of the work that Dr. Bandura did is being implemented at a, a, a pretty impressive rate. And I think there is becoming more saturation with things like Netflix. I know I've seen some of the some of the figures that Netflix is now on par, maybe even surpassing traditional cable as far as subscriptions go. Wow. Which is pretty powerful. Now yeah. Netflix is 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 the is one. passing up yeah. what actual traditional TV gave. And, the, you know, that's cool. Yeah. That's cool. That's pretty cool. That's cool. Whatever. So <laughs> we were going with this with the next research. Yeah. Yeah. So now that is just like a kind of starting point around how our biases might start developing. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, Dr. Bandura's work maybe helped us see a glimpse of how we start accumulating these uh, plans to action through the people that we meet and talk to and see interacting with each other. That is my view of how the social cognitive theory comes into this into this story. Right now. I want to go back and just think a little bit about how these biases actually affect people, mm -hmm. right? Uh, recently, I went to a talk with Jason Okonofua, uh, who did some work with Jennifer Eberhardt, we mentioned earlier, but he's, he's at Berkeley. And some of his work looks at the effects of biases on uh, disciplinary actions on children in schools. And I find this very interesting to think about because... Um, I uh, it's it's pretty well known, and I, I I think I can say this without a reference that school becomes sort of a pipeline to the rest of your life's um, opportunity. Mm -hmm. So children who do very badly in school and have a lot of uh, um, issues with discipline or grades and things like that are generally having lower lifetime earnings, more likely to go to prison, more likely to have drug abuse and things like that. Whereas people who are doing well in school are, you know, having lo larger lifetime earnings and longer health. And there's a lot of things, lifetime outcomes that are connected in some way. I'm not going to say specifically how much or causally how that's happening, mm -hmm. but it's pretty clear that there's a trend that if you were doing well in academic pursuits, you are also doing better in lifetime earnings and, and life outcomes comes right okay so there is something very important about what happens in school for our opportunity in life i think that's the point i'm trying to display it creates a vision of yourself as well i mean i don't sure. want to create the cause but i also imagine that it builds the confidence the foundation of how you want to put out towards more than that it builds our social capital because mm -hmm. when we are going out into the world, our social capital is the credentials we have, the skills we have, you know, the people we know. These are all different parts of what we're bringing into the world as, you know, money making or opportunity making capital. Mm -hmm. Right. And if you do well in school, you're essentially being acclimated and normalized to the white male dominant narrative that is pervasive in America. Mm -hmm. And so by becoming and acclimating to that narrative, you are essentially more willing and ready to engage with the people that are also in that narrative with you. Right. So you just have more capital to be able to do more things if you're successful in the social norms of what we've set up. That was a mouthful. But I'm going to go on with this. Okay? Gotcha. Now, what they found is that there, the bias of teachers towards students because of their color or not even their color, just being named with a name that sounds like they are a certain race or being told that they are from a certain race drastically changed the amount of discipline that children were getting in school. Discipline. Were they getting more or less? Well, let's talk about that. So it's funny. It's a funny thing because uh, I don't know. Funny is not the right word, but it is a difficult thing because the first infraction, either being um, just being troubled by a student's actions or taking disciplinary action was basically the same for white and black kids. OK, the, the white or black kids would basically get the same first warning. Oh, you did something wrong. 
stop that or whatever, mm-hmm. right? But the second one, whenever if there was a repeat offense or a repeat concern or a repeat need or po- a perception of a need for disciplinary action, what they found is that the second one was much more harsh or frequent mm. when it was a black child versus a white child. Why? Yeah. Like, well, is that because, I don't know, does the professor or the teacher need to feel like they're, they're the savior and discipline them more to... Well, I think there's a lot to unpack in there, and I don't know if I could totally answer your question, but I think what I could say is first, as a a first pass, this is seems to be a piece of bias coming up. Yes, it does. This seems to be a biased reaction that is disproportionately given to certain types of students based on whatever attributes the teachers are hearing or even being fed because sometimes these these, these tests have actually, these these, uh, research paradigms have been used uh, both in real classrooms and in the lab. Okay. So sometimes they did something just as simple, the same exact scenario. They say, here's a kid, they did something. Their name is Jason or Jamal. And the very, just the tiniest difference of just changing the name changed the perception and the, the prescribed result that teachers gave of what they thought should happen to the kid uh, based on these just very simple contrived scenarios like, oh, they got up out of their seat or something without being, you know, without asking. Mm-hmm. And the, the punitive damages become much more prevalent or, or harsh for the kids that had these you know, black sounding names, mm-hmm. which is just such a simple, tiny change. So right? simple, but it just seems, it's just, um, it's crazy to think really how much our bias is basically level, like taken into consideration of every area of our language. It's like from our language to our visual, to our, how we perceive like abstract things. It's getting all these different areas and come from all of these different areas and in my head, like after like hearing all this too, it makes me think bias bad. This is bad. Well, <laughs> so can we say that in any way that bias is a good thing? Well, or is would, it only yeah, good would, for some people? I would challenge that. I don't think bias is. Um, I don't think it has any value to it as good or bad as its own self. It is not. It is not something that you can judge. It is only bad. Um, you know, I'm doing air quotes here. Bad. When it is causing you to do things that maybe you don't think are acceptable or that are hurting people that you don't want to be hurting. And this goes back to this idea, is your bias in line with your beliefs? Because if a racist person is doing racist things, in their mind, they're not doing something bad. They're doing something perfectly in line with who they are and what they believe. Mm. You know, I could look at them from an outside perspective and be like, I think that's bad. But again, that's a value judgment I'm putting on it. So I wouldn't think of it that way. Now, the other side of that is you could have a bias that is really good. You could have a bias to help children or old people. Or you could have a bias to favor women in a science role, right? And by having that bias, you may be more inclined to break the stereotypes that are causing, you know, women to have less uh, less presence in science, for instance, or other things like that. So your biases are not really like there's no value to them until you put them in a social context where they actually change or affect the way you're acting. And that could be considered good or bad, but, you know, either by your own self judgment or by an external like social value judgment over mm-hmm. who you are. But I try to stay away from those things. It's really hard. Like good, like, bad. Yeah, it's like morality is a thing like we are not going to agree, right? So when as soon as I start saying good or bad to something, it's automatically different for the next person hearing it. So it's just kind of So weird. then my question to you as a researcher, what's the objective of looking at bias? Oh my gosh. Not to yeah, categorize yeah. it as good as bad or bad, then you're well, just like saying we have bias and that's it. Well, you know, the, the, you know, the saying knowledge is power, right? Yeah. And understanding something doesn't necessarily make it good or bad. It's what you do with it afterwards. It's the, the power comes in how you use that knowledge. Right. Okay. And so I think uh, bias research is very important because it does have such a powerful effect and a pull on the way we do things and why we do them or Mm -hmm. if we even are aware that we're doing them. Right. Now, uh, we were just talking about some research looking at children getting increased punitive damages or or disciplinary actions based on their 
uh, skin color or name or perceived um, racial placement or yeah, and this is also done in classrooms with real students too. Mm-hmm. Now this also is connected. There's there's a, a piece of research that's been done and this, I think this has been repeated in a few different ways too, but it is looking at job applicants. Yeah. And this is a pretty famous one where they sent out a whole bunch of applications and they were the exact same applications, but just with the names changed. Mm. And they found people who had a racial sounding name ended up getting much fewer callbacks, much fewer interviews, much fewer opportunity as a result of their mailing out a resume. Now, that's powerful, right? That I feel like I want like another like a moment of silence on that. Like, crap, wow, why is that happening? Right. Exactly. Um, and I think this is, is huh. along the same lines of the bias of the, the, the people reading these these resumes they may not be aware of it. They may not be consciously sorting through them going, oh, white name, black name, white name, black name. But this is that categorical thinking anyway. And this bubbles up in us whether we like it or not. So are these also like, can we characterize these through generational bias? I mean, there are certainly generational biases. And I, <laughs> so one, one, another interesting result is that old people have shown a strong tendency to be biased against old people. Uh, yeah. How? Now, well, uh, so this this is very similar to African Americans being biased against other African Americans because of the ideas that so, we put yeah, out. Yeah, I mean, okay. In okay. in America, we have a strong ageist tendency. Yes, we think old people. I mean, I I actually have a very strong preference for old people in my uh, my uh, <laughs> my um, age IATs, but in general, we think old people basically are useless. Huh. And it sucks. It's not true. It's not true. But the way we perceive being elderly is, you know, oh, you're retired. Yeah. You're, you're not contributing anymore. You're just sort of. That's a, like the fundamental value of being an American. Are you contributing right. to society? Right, right. And, you know, in and if you go way back in human evolution, in the hunter gatherer stage of human evolution, older people didn't even live that long, but the older people were essentially like the the people that kept care of camp and took care of the children. Mm. And they weren't, you know, I mean, I think I think children being raised by old people actually end up being a lot more well-rounded because these young energetic parents, they're they're just like too busybody. They're just hovering over their kid all the time and fixing every little problem. An old person isn't going to get up and stop every little thing that happens. Every bumped knee is not going to get caught before it happens. But I don't know how to frame this actually. <laughs> Like in my mind, thinking about how the older generation can kind of be more conservative or. Oh, sure. Sure. And then and that, that would end yeah, up fostering yeah. that continual. Well, this, is a, this is a social thing. <laughs> no, that you're I went, up, I went right? off a little bit of a tangent. That's OK. There. That's OK. But I think what you're bringing up is valid in that maybe in, in the current social trends. maybe. But that's different. Yeah. 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 But the idea yeah. of having a place in society where you can contribute. And, and seeing people as still having something to give, even when they're maybe not as physically active, mm-hmm. that's a powerful thing. And we don't really have that as a general trend in we our don't, perception. We don't use that at all. And now I can tell you this just from my own personal experience, getting old. <laughs> I, am, I am currently getting old. A You're second, still young. A second older every second that passes. I'm getting old. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're all getting old. Uh, as time passes, we grow old. That's a thing. But... Um, what I can tell you is just you don't feel much older as you keep getting older. And I think that is the underlying mechanism there. And this I'm is starting this, to feel it in my back, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, you should maybe go get a massage or something. You got to spoil yourself from time to time and take care of yourself. But but, yeah. um, but the point is, is it, I think older people generally have this bias towards older people because they haven't yet realized that they are one of them. Mm. And that would be just my own hypothesis. Like so a don't, denial. Don't, don't put that in your presentation. Okay. But, <laughs> but the idea is, yeah, if you're 80 years old and you still feel like you're just the same person you always were, you're not looking at yourself and being like, oh, I'm old. I better like make more old friends. Well, that's right? because we created what being old means into a bucket. Again, sure, going back sure. to those buckets. Sure. And, and the, they're not, you're basically, if you are a, like they like to say, a young spirit, that all that really means is that you... You don't like, yet see yourself as old, right? Is that yeah, though? Yeah. Or maybe it just means that you haven't, you're not, like being old is just 
like a chosen old I, that maybe can't you know, explain I, that I, well. I like I like the saying you're only as old as you feel. Yeah. Right? Because I think that's that's fair. Like the social and, norm you know, of what I mean, that means. I'm thirty eight years old. I still feel like I'm twelve, honestly. <laughs> I think I still act like I'm twelve half the time. So what does that mean? But anyway What the, does that mean? <laughs> what does it mean? But, you're a twelve year old boy. <laughs> <laughs> well <laughs> at least I can buy alcohol. So that's something, right? <laughs> Not that I barely ever advanced. drink. What are we talking about? Where where is this conversation. This is like spiraling down the drain. That is biased towards a 12-year-old boy. <laughs> that just sounds wrong. We're going to move on. Okay. <laughs> anyway, the point is um, yes. th- these age biases, I think, are, are prevalent because we don't necessarily see ourselves as old. Also, um, yeah, it's just the identity yeah, the that identity. we have carries with us. It doesn't change. And this is something you asked earlier. Is this a stable thing? Does it just stay that way? Yeah. And I would imagine um, like my my age bias is in favor of old people. So I probably will have an age bias in favor of old people when I'm old, too. You'll be like, we know so much. Yeah, yeah. You little hooligans, age you children. Equals wisdom. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So, I, I have a bias towards that myself. Yeah. Sure, sure. And so these biases are probably more likely it's just if you were biased against old people when you were young, you're probably still biased against them when you're old. So what can you specifically be biased for against or what can you can is there something that you cannot be biased towards? Does that make sense? Like is there can you be biased towards an object? Um, I'd say yeah, but uh, it's probably more in the context of like a proposition of what you would do with that object. So if I say coffee cup, you're like, great. It's just a, a, a statement. I drink right? coffee. But yes. if I say, can you pick that coffee cup and bring it out over here? That's a proposition or like I'm asking you to do something and you might be like, yes or no. And that could be like a bias. Right. And so I would. So I would, it's the action that is the bias? Um, well, <laughs> <laughs> it's a little sticky there. There's, yeah. there's no clear delineation unless you're really trying to get very specific for a purpose. And I okay. think that's an important thing to think about is everything we, we want to define, whether it's bias or something else, uh, the definition is only as good as the use of the definition. And I think maybe a good example of this is the definition of like uh, disability, for instance. Disability has a medical definition, which is used to give you medical services, Whereas disability has a social definition, which is sort of used to bias against people or Mm. for people. Right. Um, So the definition is really context dependent as far as what you plan to do with it. Okay. Right. So if you're studying bias and you're really interested in only certain types of bias, then you may define it in a very specific way to be able to use that definition properly. Mm -hmm. And that's really like an important sort of nuance of just understanding what what we're doing with our terms in general is only as good as what we plan to do with them or the purpose of the term in the first place. So I'm getting off topic here. This is going quick. Can't be biased against air, can you? Someone just texted in. <laughs> it I would, guess not. It, it would be a strange if you were biased against air, you would suffocate very quickly. And <laughs> no, I as, do not as like a, air. As a human being, that just means you pass out, then you wake up and you're breathing again. So that would be a silly, yeah. I don't. Th- I think you. I over, think you found the the yeah, rhyming yeah, word for biased, bias orange I, I, orange air. I think we are biased towards breathing. I could definitely say that one. I have been biased towards breath my whole life. I keep doing it, and so do you. Everyone, actually, <laughs> you have every, a great bias. Everyone I know is biased towards breathing. It's <laughs> I a think this cool... person's having a really good time. Oh uh, well, or water or land. I don't know. Well, I yeah. think pirates are biased towards water <laughs> and the fish. Arrgh, we be out on the sea. <laughs> I don't know who this person is. And colonists they, they are sound... biased towards land. Yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> exactly. This person is great. Thank you for chiming Thank you. in. We love yeah, our listeners here. If you have, if you have anything you want to chime in with, you can t- uh, text us eight five five. 723-9010 and we also of course love to hear you on the Twitter yes. uh, at KZSU at KZSU DJ and we love hearing from this you guys so we, good. we are silly and we love to hear from yeah. you too thank you so much for texting in whoever you are you're great thank too you, thank you uh, but Let's get back to the research, shall we? Just got a few minutes left. Isn't it amazing how fast these hours go by? It is truly, truly epic how quickly an hour can go by talking with you. Epic modern education with Ben Woodford. (laughs) And Emily Keela is here on 90.1 KZSU. We're here every Friday from 3 to 4 p.m. for your commute, just in case this is your first time tuning in. We hope you'll come back. Uh, The the last piece, I think this is going to be the last piece of research I'm going to share this hour. the puzzle piece? 
Uh, so this was uh, done in 2015 by Leslie et al. And this is uh, a piece of research. And I have a graph in front of you, but you don't if you are listening <laughs> on the air. So you have a graph in front of you, too. But I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to our listeners. And this is very okay. important. OK, so <laughs> the graph that's in front of me is showing a, 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 a distribution of correlations between professors belief that you need talent to be successful in your in your discipline mm. and the number of female PhDs that are graduating in that field each year. Yeah. And the general trend, I'm going to spoil the punchline because we're on radio and I can't show you the graph, but the general trend is that the more professors believe you need a certain level of talent or natural ability to be able to do the discipline, the fewer women are graduating in that field with PhDs. I'm going to let that settle in for a minute and I'm going to say it one more time. Yeah, you need to say that again. The more professors in college believe that you have to have talent, innate talent to be good at your field, the fewer women are graduating with PhDs in that discipline. Interesting. Now, to me, this is a huge piece of evidence pointing towards bias. Now, uh, in the graph I have right in front of me, it's broken down into STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, math, or, Mm -hmm. you know, the science-y type disciplines, and then the the more more humanities, right? And what we see is in both both, both domains, the same trend shows up. Now, on the highest end in STEM is mathematics. And is it specifically for women? It's not shown in men? Uh, well, yeah, is, there's nothing interesting happening there with men, okay. right? Men okay. just are running everything. That's why the world is set up the way it is. And I personally think it's time to be down with the patriarchy, but Thank that's you. a little much. So I'm going <laughs> to, I'm doing a fist in the air right now. Sure. But anyway, so math is perceived as needing the highest innate talent, right? And it has one of the fewest uh, rates of women graduating in, with a PhD. Another one that has one of the fewest physics so generally you know professors seem to believe you need a lot of talent to be a physicist or mathematician and consequently we are also seeing low numbers of females graduating with phds in those fields like these are the very few of society that can actually gain this information these are these are sure they're hard hard topics or hard disciplines but they certainly don't need a man to do them and they certainly don't need some innate talent they can be trained trust me something this reminds me of a guest we had with Felicia Darling and growth yeah, mindset right. that opposed to, okay, you're not bad at, you're not good at math, then go to writing. If you're not good at this, then go to that. I can tell you're better at that. So I think as opposed to that, she mm-hmm. was saying we need to start focusing as teachers to look at more that we can grow. Like when, when she was using the example of soccer, that you, when you first learn soccer, you practice, you weren't just good at it at first. Right, right. And that is something that I think really can define or split the education system and how kind of what you're explaining here of like sure. growth mindset versus innate. Yeah. And things can be learned. I can tell you, I was not, I was not born a mathematician, but I got trained. Mm-hmm. I did a whole bunch of math and now I feel pretty confident that I can call myself a mathematician. I have a degree in it. I've done many interesting math problems and topics, and I know how to read and write in mathematics, and that makes me a mathematical thinker in mm-hmm. the sense that I have learned how to take on mathematical ways of seeing the world or uh, numerical perspectives. And that is essentially the skill that someone needs to be successful in whatever it is they're trying to do. Mm-hmm. Now, I want to get back to this, this distribution, yes. right? So math and physics have the highest perception of talent required and a very low rate of graduation. Now, on the other side of that same graph in the STEM field is like things like neuroscience and molecular biology. Now, these are not easy disciplines, right? These are disciplines that are just as hard as math and physics, but they are disciplines that study human potential, like neuroscience, for instance. Neuroscientists don't believe you need to be talented to be a neuroscience really? uh, neuroscientist because they study the brain and they realize anyone's brain is just about the same as any other person's brain. Okay, yeah. And so there are, there are more women graduating in neuroscience and gotcha. neuroscientists don't believe that you need natural talent because so they understand kind of neuroplasticity. The idea that females are only like capable of the social bits 
Right, right. That's just not true. Yeah. He, he, humans are capable of just about anything and human, different humans have humans. different, <laughs> hu, different humans yes. have different talents and that is not gender specific, although it is largely a socialized difference. So we see gender differences, but those are largely, and, and most of the research or the, the research I'm aware of and have seen have shown that those differences are socialized and there is a very small part of that that is like genetic or gender based in any way. And those small parts we still don't know could be genetically socially handed down. That's a very hard thing mm-hmm. to research. So mm-hmm. I can't really make any real claims about that. But I, I we had Ben, ben Demang on the show who studies some of these um, um, genetic differences in the way things come out. And it's a very, very small amount. And this is not something that's significant enough to demonstrate to or say that it's dictate what okay. someone is capable of. Interesting. It, it may just point more to the natural. Do you know if that's the same for ethnic Absolutely. Yeah. There is no. I'm gr- happy yeah, to hear that. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. There is no racial gender truths about who's smart and who isn't. Okay. That isn't just not coming up. In Someone any tried making that argument with way. me earlier. Yeah. Yeah. Happy well, they're wrong. That. They're yes, wrong. I thought so. Now, the differences <laughs> that come up through, you know, SAT testing and things like that that are showing racial disparities have much deeper connections to social constructs and things like that. Yeah. We're going to have to get off the air. Oh, my gosh. Unfortunately. Um, so if you just you tuned in, effort. this is. Is Modern Education. We're here Friday from 3 to 4 p.m. every week for your commute. We are generally doing a live show, either talking about an interesting topic or bringing in an interesting guest to talk about education, learning, and everything connected to it. I am the host of Modern Education. Thank you for tuning in. And this is Emily Keyless. And my wonderful co-host over there is with me every week as we break down a new topic, talk with a new guest, and learn a little bit more about ourselves and each other. Thank you for listening. Thank you for tuning in. This is Modern Education right here on the Stanford campus. Come back next week, Friday from 3 to 4 p.m.